St. John's and specifically the graduates and postgraduates graduating today are indeed blessed and privileged to have with us Dr. Shashi Tharoor as our chief guest. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is known for his knowledge, intelligence, vocabulary, eloquence, wit, humor, and of course his charm. He's a role model of today's modern and aspiring India. It is said that if you have an opportunity to hear Dr. Shashi Tharoor speaking, it is like having acquired a degree for yourself. <laughs> Inviting Dr. Shashi Tharoor, the Grand Master and Guru of all occasions. Your Eminence, Oswald Cardinal Gracious, President of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of India, Reverend Dr. Paul Parathayam, Director of the St. John's National Academy of Health Sciences, Associate Directors, Dean Dr. George D'Souza, Vice Dean Dr. Anuradha Anantamurti, Heads of Departments, Faculty, the uh, Graduate Representative Clive Martin Rodriguez, MBBS students and graduates, prize winners, especially wonderful sister Beatrice from the Batch of 64 for all that she's done. <laughs> Parents and family members, dear friends, I hope that covers everybody. It really is a great honor to be invited here on such a momentous day for St. John's Medical College as we come together to celebrate another convocation ceremony in the history of this illustrious institution. I know it is in many ways an expected tradition for a speaker to offer pains of tribute to the institute they're speaking in, but I think we can all agree that St. John's reputation is not only well beyond doubt, it is an irrefutable fact that whether you look at rankings or the volume of contributions that your alumni have made across the world, or most important, the emphasis on service to those who are less privileged, this is indeed truly a special place to be in. In many ways, it's therefore humbling to think that I'm sharing this room with young men and women who will go on to offer a beacon of hope in our healthcare industry, young men and women who will go on to shine a light for our fellow Indians who languish in the darkness created by the daily terrors of poverty and inequality, and indeed young men and women who will be the engines of our country in this century. So while I've addressed numerous convocation ceremonies and spoken at several educational institutions, I do so today with a special sense of honor and pride. This is not a college where I need to tell the students that medicine should be a calling, not a profession, that if you are motivated by money, you may as well be a banker, and that as healthcare professionals, you are here to pursue the highest calling, that of saving human lives. And in everything you do, you must not lose sight of that human, that ultimate human endeavor. I don't need to tell you that because this is a college where you are taught that from the very beginning. Before anything else, though, let me begin by extending my heartiest congratulations and my warm wishes to the graduating batch. You've had to face daunting and often unkind odds from day one, whether it was a stiff competition to even get into this college, to the expectations of your rigorous curriculum and your impressive faculty, your work with the less privileged, a rural service, marginalized sections of society through your stints in the countryside, and of course, just living up to the hallowed legacy of this institution. All of these are odds that would perhaps have crippled others and challenged all. And yet you have not only stood firm, you have succeeded, and that is why you are in this room today. While there will undoubtedly be many a battle left before the ultimate war is won, many more miles to go in the famous cliche of Robert Frost before you can sleep, and while this is only the beginning of an exciting journey, take a moment to let it sink in and give yourselves a round of applause because you more than deserve it. Thank you. 
You know, I've, I've spoken at a lot of convocations, and after a while I began to notice something, uh, which is that even in institutions where a vast majority of the student body is male, I began seeing over the years that a vast majority of the prize winners are female. <laughs> so in this uh, college, I decided to test this by actually counting the ones who came up on stage to receive the prizes. And I'm very pleased to tell you that 34 out of 46 prize winners today were female. That is 75%, my friends. I think this country is changing for the better every day. And there's one more proof of it. But my congratulations to all the young graduates who've received their degrees today. Convocation Day is obviously one of the most important days in your life. It's a day when society publicly acknowledges your hard work, intense study, and dedication by conferring you your degree. The degree certificate is therefore a reflection both of your own efforts and achievements and at the same time a token of your place in and your responsibility to the society to which you belong. As young professionals, you will have to do a lot of things and find many ways in which you can contribute to our nation. Your service to society will in turn be a reflection of the institution where you have studied. You are fortunate to have studied in and today graduated from St. John's. And this is also the moment then to applaud the teachers and administrators who have accompanied and guided you on your journey. Let's give them a hand. Now, one looks up the etymology of the term convocation, one can find its origins in the Latin term, convocationem, literally, to call together, and indirectly in the old French word, convocation, with a similar significance of an assembly of persons. Now, if there's any time in our history when the importance of coming together could be vehemently emphasized, it's now. I don't think one needs to be in Parliament or even have come from the United Nations to realize that in a fractured, impatient, and yet hopeful world, education is the most significant instrument of maintaining peace and harmony, upholding human rights and fundamental freedoms, and resolving disputes through democratic dialogue and effective leadership. Medical education is at the pinnacle of this challenge. Becoming a doctor is a childhood dream for many. Perhaps there is no other career which commands such respect and awe as medicine. The power to heal has placed the medical profession several rungs above all others. A doctor's profession involves both the hard work and dedication that you've already shown to reach here today, and at the same time it also brings with it the satisfaction of having cured people suffering from illness, disease, and trauma. In fact, the emphasis on life was evident even throughout this ceremony. I was very struck that when you chose to honor His Eminence Cardinal Gracious and myself, you didn't do so by giving us bouquets, which involve, after all, the massacring of the flowers, but with live saplings needing nurture and care to stay alive. What a wonderful symbol of this college's reverence for life. <clears throat> to the young graduates in the blue-trimmed robes, Looking at those in the orange trim and uh, more so the ones in the light yellow trim, you know that a simple degree in medicine is probably not enough to make a successful career. Many of you, I asked a few of you, uh, many of you will go on to specialize in um, one of the branches of medicine or surgery. But whether you do so or not, increasingly doctors have to acquire new skills that the previous generation might not have. You have to acquire certain computer and IT skills, which are necessary to operate uh, and use the sophisticated equipment without which the advanced practice of medicine is no longer possible. Soon new technologies involving artificial intelligence will help you make a better diagnosis of an ailing patient. Robotics will help you conduct surgical procedures. Meanwhile, other advances might provide you with options to use non-invasive methods of treatment. The process of learning does not end today. It will have to go on. This occasion marks not the end of your learning, not even the beginning of the end, but merely the end of the beginning. Advances in medical sciences have enhanced our longevity and decreased mortality rates dramatically. 
However, industrialization and technological advancement have also adversely affected our environment and our lifestyles. And this has manifested itself in new types of diseases and ailments, which pose new challenges to the medical fraternity. The demand for medical professionals um, for treatment as well as research work is ever increasing, both within India and abroad. New and better opportunities have arisen for medical professionals in terms of remuneration, research, working facilities. And yet at the same time, the acute shortage of medical professionals in rural areas persists in our country. That's why I'm always disappointed to fight the civil services. I still hope that those amongst you, and I know there's at least one, who might be contemplating a career that does not require medical training will reconsider your goals in knowing what a precious gift you have as a trained doctor, one that should not be wasted pushing files instead. It is sad but true that the medical education system in India has done little to strengthen the essential bonds between our graduates and the people they serve. In other words, our medical colleges are producing graduates who are not well equipped or at least not inclined to tackle the healthcare needs of our society. Experts tell me that most graduates are academically sound, have good marks on paper, but are often found deficient in the performance of clinical skills and problem solving, which form the core of clinical competence. Another complaint is that many doctors prefer to stay in the comfort of big cities and to specialize in diseases of the rich. St. John's, I know, emphasizes work among the rural poor in the course of your education, and I hope that is not an emphasis that you will allow to fade from your lives once you have graduated. And again, a tribute to Sister Beatrice and all that she's been doing since 1964 in this direction. The 21st century has presented us with unprecedented challenges. Deep-rooted poverty, the expanding nexus of discriminatory politics, resource curses and crises, a politics of hatred and division that exploits communal differences, and perhaps the greatest threat of our times, the rapidly deteriorating environmental situation, are the strongest reminders of why education should be and remain our first priority. Malala Yousafzai and Greta Thunberg have seized the imagination of the world even before going to college. In India, too, we have thousands of young graduates like you. It's time that you, too, transformed our nation with your innovations, your skills, and your expertise. Educated young people are our vital bulwarks against complete chaos and social breakdown. Young people and your ideas would be the edifice upon which our future will be built. And this is the future that we in India should be investing in. I would like to congratulate St. John's for its pioneering efforts to bring a discernible change in the field of Indian healthcare education and services. I see that the academy has come a long way from its humble beginnings to its magnificent current campus. In the process, St. John's has done great service to the nation by creating a pool of trained, value-driven, and committed healthcare professionals. Father Paul warned against the commodification of healthcare in his opening remarks. This, I think, remains a key warning. Given the scale and the energy invested in this institution, it's no surprise that it has received universal recognition and acclaim. Being an ardent supporter of indigenous healthcare research, I was very pleased to learn that the teachers and students of this institution have together done a lot of research, published several research papers, and the quality of this kind of research activity in medicine and allied health sciences being pursued on this campus is worth applauding. I wish it will continue and add to the luster that this college already enjoys. You may be aware that according to the World Bank, India has just seven doctors per 10,000 people. How do we compare with the rest of the world? China has 19, USA has 25, Australia has 33. We have seven. In other words, going by these numbers, as of today, India needs about four lakh more doctors. Clearly, our country needs many more institutions such as this if we are to meet the minimum health care needs of our citizens. My dear students, I also hope you value the high quality of education that you have received at this academy. As you graduate today, you become part of the community of medical practitioners of India who are working tirelessly to serve our nation. For each of you today, 
This convocation will have multiple interpretations as you step out of this college. You could choose to interpret this world as one of insurmountable sufferings or one that provides great opportunities. The choice is yours. But what do you do with that? The answer in some ways lies in the words of the momentous speech by our first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, at that midnight moment on August 15, 1947, when after hailing our country's tryst with destiny, he said, it is fitting that at this solemn moment, we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. I hope that you choose to align your interpretation to your profession and medical practice so you could truly serve your nation and humanity at large. I hope you also realize that not every profession in this world is bestowed with such responsibility and faith. I pray those words of Nehru help you understand the gravity of the title doctor before your name, which you heard for the first time as you came up to collect your degree from me. In addition to those words, you're also armed with the Hippocratic Oath, which was administered to you a few minutes ago. This oath not only binds you to your profession, your colleagues, your patients, but really to nothing less than the whole of humanity. The oath outlines the principles of probity, of secrecy, service, humanity, and excellence, which must continue to guide you in your toughest endeavors, your darkest hours, and through the immense satisfaction and glory that awaits you. You must never fail to abide by it. My old boss of this, the United Nations, the late Secretary General Kofi Annan, used to love telling the story of the hen and the pig discussing the problems of the world. So they're discussing one problem after another assailing humanity, and the hen says to the pig, my gosh, you know, we have to do something about this. And the pig says, well, we're just a hen and a pig. What can we do to solve all these problems? And the hen says, listen, we just break up these problems into little items, and we do our best, we can solve them. So the pig says, how? And the hen says, listen, look at hunger, for example. The world is full of hunger. So why don't we do something? I'll produce the eggs, and you produce the bacon. And between us, we'll get hunger licked. So the pig kicks up its hind legs and thinks for a minute, and then it says, aha, uh -huh. so you produce the eggs, huh? and I produce the bacon. Yours is a contribution. Mine is total commitment. <laughs> now, I'm telling you the story, which he used to love to tell, because in many ways, the doctors are the pigs in the story. <laughs> we are demanding total commitment from you. By granting you your medical degrees, India is demanding your total commitment towards working towards of the future, uh, working for the future of our youthful country. Our youthful demographic will only work if we can keep them healthy and in a position to be able to seize the opportunities of the 21st century. You're joining this workforce as part of a greater whole, and therefore you must contribute, make your own individual contribution to the progress of the country and the well-being of that entire cohort. At the same time, you're also guardians now, literally, as doctors, of our well-being. And you're integral to ensuring that we are in a position to make something out of our youthful demographic. I'm sharing this with you because it's imperative for everyone who's graduating today to recognize the need to go beyond your academic understanding, your traditional and conventional learning of medicine, and the concerns of the bottom line as you go on to become practitioners. You've been told, of course, I said I didn't need to say it, but I'll say it anyway once more, that at its very core, the field of medicine, unlike many of its counterparts, is not just a profession, it's a calling. Not only are you uniquely equipped and placed to address the critical needs of our country, needs that are integral to our collective survival, but to deliberately ignore this reality would mean a disservice not just to the people of India, but the very legacy of the profession you would practice. Don't reduce the Hippocratic Oath to a hypocritical oath. All of you probably recognize this better than most, that we in India are dealing with a challenging, if not alarming, situation in the field of medicine. India struggles with an abysmal doctor-to-patient ratio of roughly 1 to 2,000, double the WHO minimum standard of 1 to 1,000. Even more alarming is the fact that when you look at this ratio, just from the perspective of allopathic government doctors, 1 to 2,000 includes every practitioner in every field. But if you look at the allopathic doctors, it's worse. It's 1 is to 11,082, which is 10 times what the WHO recommends. And if you thought that was bad, 
then wait till you hear that ratio uh, when you look at specific non-communicable diseases, for example. Take the field of mental health, where the psychiatrist to patient ratio in India is one doctor to 1.25 lakh patients, whereas the minimum prescribed by the Indian Psychiatric Association should be one as to 10,000. And that reflects the low priority given to the funding of med mental health care in India. In the previous budget of the government, the allocation for mental health was 0.06% of the overall health care budget. Now, so this is a challenge that's compounded by poor policy making at the top, an unwillingness to invest more in our public health system and sparse infrastructure. That means the reality for the majority of our fellow Indians today is dismal. We all know that poverty is one of the biggest challenges for India, even in the 21st century. But I hope you understand the extraordinary role that healthcare plays in deciding the fate of India's poor. The working poor are one economic shock, you know, which for a daily wage laborer could mean as little as missing a few days' work and pay on account of illness. One economic shock away from slipping again below the poverty line. A catastrophic or terminal illness like cancer could mean wiping out a family's economic security as land and home are sold to meet the medical expenses of the sole breadwinner when he's no longer able to earn to support his family. About 47% and 31% of hospital admissions, 47 in rural, 37, 31 in urban India, respective sets. We must understand that poverty is an outcome first and a cause later, usually triggered by a health catastrophe. India's poor, in other words, are living just one serious illness away from poverty. You can do a great service to India by creating a buffer between such families and the vicious poverty trap. The situation I've described is not the fault of any one government or ruling party alone. We are all to blame. We have a shameful record of having one of the lowest proportions of GDP dedicated for healthcare, even among developing countries. Our proportion of GDP dedicated to healthcare is roughly around 1% at a time when the WHO recommends 5%. At the same time, we have one of the highest out-of-pocket expenditure levels in the world. A 2017 Lancet survey pointed out that amongst 184 countries studied, India and Bangladesh jointly had the sixth largest out-of-pocket expenditures. And that is, according to the World Bank, 86% in India as a percentage of private expenditure on health. Out-of-pocket is 86%, 56.8% in the UK, 32 in France, just 20 in the US, with insurance companies pay the rest. Overall, 65.5% of all healthcare expenditure in India is private while the global average is only 28%. So obviously, this is why it's contributed so much to poverty levels in our country at a time when successive governments are trying to move the marginalized and the poor in the opposite direction. The national sample surveys have established that healthcare expenditure between 2004 and 14, I don't have more recent figures, pushed 50.6 million citizens back into poverty in just that one decade. Now, I'm saying all of this not to depress you, not to inundate you with a reality you're probably already familiar with as students of St. John's, not even to suggest that the responsibility of addressing all of this rests on your shoulders alone. Of course it doesn't. <coughs> but to suggest that you could, should you wish, make a valuable and definitive contribution to the country with the skill sets that you have. Not only are you uniquely equipped and qualified to address some of these concerns that I've highlighted, but from the very first day that you entered the walls of this college, you've been asked to form a deeper appreciation for those who've been given less in this world and to do your own to offer them a better future in a more equal world. I'm told that one of your mission statements has to do with developing a world where quality health care is accessible and affordable even to the poorest. The ethos of this institution echoes a key sentiment of nation building, and you could be architects for a very different kind of Indian society, if you wish to do so. You know, I, I was hearing the story of, um, of Dr. Mashelka, the eminent Dr. Mashelka, who uh, established a, a prize in the memory of his, of his late mother for medical innovations. And it was very interesting that the first prize addressed a problem that was very special to India. There are so many ophthalmologists getting prizes today. You know that the standard eye test for glaucoma 
requires putting drops to dilate your eyes, which means that you get fuzzy, blurred vision for several hours. Now, why is it that in our country, so many people have glaucoma, cataracts, and are even blind? 15 million Indians are estimated to be blind for preventable reasons. Why? Many of them are from poor families. They can't, because they earn their wages by daily work, they can't afford to even test for, their, for glaucoma or cataracts because that fuzziness and dilation will actually deprive them of a day's work. Not having a day's work means they don't have a day's wages. Without a day's wages, the family doesn't eat. So the breadwinner will go on with these bad eyes and they will get worse and worse and eventually he'll go blind. So Dr. Mashilka gave his first prize to a, a chap who came up with an invention where you could examine eyes very cheaply without dilating them, very cheaply and very quickly. So people could step in from their work, literally for a few minutes, get their eyes tested and leave. It's a, it's a product, it's a device now called 3Netra, which has then swept the ophthalmological field. And one of the things that was most striking in Dr. Mashilka giving that prize was the idea that here was an innovation that responded to an Indian problem experienced by ordinary Indians. Now that's the sort of thing that it seems to me I would love to hear a graduate of St. John's coming up with one day. So as you exit this campus, you're joining, of course, those who are looking after the nation's demographic dividend. We've already talked about the various problems facing the country. I would say that there are ongoing opportunities that you can explore and that you certainly will, because on the backs of growing disposable income, favorable policy environments, rising awareness of personal health and hygiene, increasing penetration of sanitation and potable drinking water. We're now seeing the surge of medical tourism, the adoption of telemedicine, production of cheaper drugs, adoption of health information systems, all sorts of positive developments that will help you in your profession. But there is a shift to lifestyle diseases from communicable diseases. There's a growth of dissatisfaction with our country's health infrastructure. There is always the problem of rural healthcare facilities and human resource availability, as well as, of course, negligible health insurance coverage, high treatment costs. Those are the other challenges you'll have to face. Your research and practice will, I hope, leverage the positives I've mentioned while converting the negatives into cumulative forces of growth and change. Now, in addition to these uh, new developments, there are old and timeless challenges. Like any other noble calling, the healthcare profession is also coping with a mounting debate on ethical malpractices. These are matters of moral judgment where you will often find your own friends on the other side. You should not waver or worry. The dilemmas are many, to mention a few examples. The issue of the psychological impact of transplants on recipients and donor families. Stem cell research. The authenticity of clinical trials. The use of euthanasia, I notice that St. John's includes <coughs> a refusal to take life in your oath. Memory pills. Gene silencing. Artificial hearts. Age retarding devices and pills. All of these raise ethical questions that are being endlessly debated and for which there are no simple answers. Take the paradoxes of India. You know, we are the world's largest manufacturers of generic drugs for illnesses like AIDS and, 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 and TB, and yet millions of our countrymen and women can't afford access to those drugs and are suffering from AIDS and TB, and in fact, even dying from them. Or we talked about uh, Dr. Mashilka's prize, uh, let's face it, Bollywood makes four times as many movies as Hollywood. We're the biggest film producers in the world. And yet 15 million of our people can't see any of those films entirely because of preventable illness. So as doctors, how do you judge what is right and what is wrong? It's easier, of course, to talk about ethics than to practice ethics. In a world of inducements, glamour and fame, it's a challenge. Your Hippocratic Oath teaches you that your first principle must be to do no harm. The philosopher who sought to establish ethical rules on the firmest possible foundation, Immanuel Kant, he put forward a very simple question as a basic ethics, ethical principle that I found useful in life. And you might want to bear this in mind. Kant said, before you consider doing something that may or may not be right, just ask one question to yourself. What if everyone did that? 
So if you're tempted to do something wrong, you ask, what if everyone did that? And you wouldn't like the results, then don't do it. I believe it's a very simple logic, and it works most of the time as an eloquent compass for moral, to resolve moral dilemmas. Ethics, after all, in any field serve as a sort of anti-clogging device that cleans the system every now and then, lest it burst from the pressures of greed and corruption. Medicine cannot serve humanity without ethics. So you graduate today not only as healthcare professionals, but also as educated young Indians. You'll be facing the challenges of the real world. There's no real template for those conundrums. I can only ask you to rely on the basics, the fundamentals, the values that your parents and this academy have so assiduously taught you. And there's where you'll find your answers to the puzzles of the real world. Of course, as a politician, I would also urge you to rise to the larger challenge of securing the destiny of India, a civilization as old as history itself. In your life as an Indian citizen, you may have to face problems that spill well beyond your professional sphere. I hope you will have, as a result of your education here, thoughtful minds, cultured souls, and sound character, so that you can strive to protect India's legacy for future generations. The legacy of deep-rooted pluralism, of rich culture, of an ethos of social justice, of young democracy and inherent secularism. You are the guardians and the proponents of that legacy. Some of you may feel it's easy for people standing at a podium with whatever they've done in their lives to preach to you, whereas you're young and you still have many obstacles to face on the path uphill. Yes, you must remember there will be roadblocks. In those times, do stop for a bit, draw in your strength, knowing that the colors of life are splashed on a larger canvas and that to move a few paces ahead, one sometimes must take a few steps back. Never be afraid of failure. Experiment, keep trying, you will succeed. Success is sweet, but it teaches far less than failure does. There is no truly successful person in the world who has not known any setbacks. What matters is not how hard you fall, but how strongly you pick yourself up again. Trust me, I have been there. The country in your hands today. You are the masters and commanders of your destiny, as well as of ours. Be the best you can be at whatever you choose to do. No one can be better than you at being you. Don't let yourself down, and years later, when you look back, you will see that your career has indeed been a contribution to our country's success. So aspire, not for yourself alone, but for your community, for your country, for the world. Make a change for the better and leave behind that change as your legacy. I do want to say, in seeing all of you in your bright faces as you came up to collect your degrees, I'm confident I can rest my faith with you and your ability to not only recognize India's greatest weaknesses and turn them into strengths, but also in your capacity to uphold universal values and goals that can create a stronger world for generations to come. Be proud of what you've accomplished. Be optimistic and enthusiastic about what you will accomplish and achieve great and wonderful things that will make all the guests present, your faculty, your friends, all of us on the stage, swell with pride and joy. The world awaits you. Make it a better place. But before you go out and do that, take a moment to thank those who have helped you to get this far in life, in particular your parents who are here and family members who are here today. Remember the many sleepless nights your parents spent caring for you, whether you had exams or were taken ill. Remember how they put your needs above their own. And remember, most importantly, that it's the values they instilled in you that make you who you are and determine where you are in life. Parents, congratulations are due to you as well, as much as they are due to your children today, for it is your years of tireless efforts over the years that have made these young children of yours the successful individuals whose doctor degrees we celebrate today. But I urge parents, support them in whatever they decide to do. I really hope that we will not be the kinds of parents, and many of you are probably younger than I am, 
and I tried not to be that, who kept trying to live our dreams through our children. You have equipped them with their education, let them step out into the world and decide how best they can serve the world in the ways you have equipped them. Dear graduates, today is yours. Seize it, and for all of us, build a better tomorrow. Thank you. Congratulations, Jehan. That was a wonderful and memorable message for our graduating doctors. As always, you had your audience enthralled with your eloquence and your thought-provoking words.